Good morning. This is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday, April the 3rd uh, worship service recording. We're glad you're here with us. Pray the Lord blesses you. If you're watching this online, re remember that you're going to need a, a Bible, your um, sermon outline, and some unleavened bread and some grape juice so you can partake of the Lord's Supper. Remember, if you want to send a contribution, don't send it to the physical building address because we don't get mail here. Send it to the P.O. box. It's good to see all of you here. We're glad that the Lord's blessed you. It's good to see some faces we hadn't seen for a while because they were out and visiting or, and moved away and then have come back for George's uh, memorial and George's uh, um, thoughts. And so we're, we're glad that you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you. As I mentioned, Brother Bill will be directing our, our song service. And uh, his first song is, uh, remember we also have uh, We Worship Today. Oh, which reminds me that Brother Sandy had had cataracts in one eye, but he's here. Uh, he had cataract surgery in one eye, but he's here. So he, there, we will be having a We Worship, and we're glad that his cataract surgery is going well. He has one more eye to do, but he's only got two. Uh, so he has one, one more eye to do, and uh, then he'll be able to see us clearly. So... Uh, we're, we're glad God has blessed him with that. Brother Bill's going to lead, be leading our song service, and our first song is number 531. <clears throat> so many ways. 
sing this song in the car, and I always got the part of the bass. So I'll see if I can remember how it goes. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin from the peaceful shore. Very deeply sank within, seeming to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love of this group and support of those that have recently lost lives. We especially thank you now. I thank you on behalf of the family of Aunt Faye and the Uncle George's passing and for the love that they have shown her and continue to be with her and comfort her, be with everyone as they surround her with their love. We pray that you'll be with the family that just lost a young woman and we pray that you would comfort them as well as the one that was also mentioned. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with Brother Mendes as he speaks from your word today. Help us to be attentive to that, to learn from it, to profit from it. Uh, we thank you for the good words that he presented in his Bible class this morning. Heavenly Father, especially we pray that you'll be with us now as we presently remember the death of your Son and our Savior and we thank you for this memorial that you set up for us to remember that. And we pray that you'll be with us to be awed by the love that he had for us by coming and suffering for us, taking our place, that we may have life everlasting. We also thank you, Lord, that he intercedes our prayers, that you listen to us through him. And we thank you for always hearing us. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for answering every prayer that you offer us, even though it may not be the way we want it answered, but we realize that you answer some prayers yes, and some no, and some not that way, and some perhaps not right now. And help us to be patient and remember that everything is done in your time. All these many things we ask and pray in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 song to help prepare minds for partaking the Lord's Supper. If uh, if you need the cup and the bread, uh, if you raise your hand, we'll see to it that, that you get, get that. And if you need a sermon outline, uh, just let us know and Troy will, will deliver that to you. Tell me the story. Tell me the story of Jesus right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels 
Good morning. 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 I know you're waiting. <laughs> Did you thank him this morning? Yes. Uh, thank him again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. For just letting us be here this morning, Lord, to give you the praise and honor you deserve. I have to say something. I want this on my mind. I know we pray for all of the people that be massacred and all these different things that we do which is the right thing to do. But Jesus gave it life for us. And <laughs> where we go from there? He volunteered to do this. And that's why we're here this morning. For his memorial. It's another thing to get killed or things happen to you, but just up and just give your life for somebody that the things that they did was wrong and that, that takes a lot. I don't think I could do it. But I hope that God would put in my heart that I would have the courage to face these things. So we're here this morning to praise our Lord Jesus Christ for the suffering that he did for us, which we know he volunteered to do. And we ask him to just continue blessing us as people and give us the love that we need to know how to respect one another. Because we've lost all of that. They could take these words out of the dictionary. We don't have no more respect for each other. But uh, I pray that something be said here this day uh, through the words that my brother Mike is bringing us that will remind us of the thing that we should know in life that we should be able to know how to live with one another and to love one another as people instead of doing bodily harm <coughs> or taking a life something that you can't replace. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for just, just being here for us. Amen. And let me pray to you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Heavenly Father, for just coming to this earth and bringing the word to us that we'll open our eyes and ears to see the thing that you want us to know and hear. We are hard-headed people, Lord. It takes a lot to, to get through to us. It takes a lot of tragedies in our life to get us to understand that life is not meant for all of these things that we go through. We should learn how to just respect one another and have peace for one another the way you want us to do and to love one another. And Lord, it's a lesson. It's a lesson that's hard for us to understand. And it's a lesson that it's just going to have to be pounded into us daily, every day. That's why in this congregation we say keep your nose in the book. To help us to understand these things. And Lord, may you enlighten me no more, Lord, so I could love my fellow man more and respect him and, and just do what I could help someone to understand that you're the, you're the reason why we are here and you're the reason why we will always be here. 
As long as we just give you the praise and honor and walk in your statutes the way you want us to do, Lord. And I thank you for this. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I have my brother to pray for the uh, prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we are thankful for giving us this wonderful opportunity to come together as your people, to partake this bread of life that represents the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, who suffered so much on the cross. We thank you for giving us your love and uh, understanding of our humility and everything. We, without the body of your Son and the sacrifice that he gave or he endured, there would be no remission of our sins. There's no forgiveness. We thank thee for your love and your mercy that you have given us this opportunity this morning to partake this bread. We pray that you all you will be always with us through eternity so that you will remember the sacrifice that your son did for us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. At this time, I'm going to ask my brother to pray for the fruit of the vine. We thank the Father for being able to partake this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, who shed so much blood and suffering in the cross, but he willingly did everything for mankind so that there will be hope of eternal life in heaven when our day is over on this earth and in this life. We pray, Father, that we partake this, remembering all that he did for us, because without his suffering, there would be no remission of sins. We pray, Father, that you be with us throughout eternity and after this life is over. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 This completes our memorial service for this morning. We come to the portion of this service where we ask that you give back a portion of your oil which you earned during the week. And I pray, Lord, that this collection that we take up this morning will be used for the purpose that it's taken up for. If you are a visitor here, we do not ask for your funds. We ask that you do fill out a visitor card so that we could just just give you the praise and honor that God has given you to be here with us this morning. And we thank you for this. We thank you for visiting us, and I hope that you will come back at the next appointed time. I will pay for my, my brother to pay for the collection. We thank the Father for everything that we enjoy in this life. We thank thee for giving us the means to give back a part of that which you have blessed us with, the bountiful blessings that we enjoy your creation. We thank thee for having the understanding that we live in peace and harmony with other people on this earth. We pray, Father, that you be with us as we give back to you the blessings that you give us. We pray that you, it will be acceptable in thy sight. We pray that you be with us always, that we are so thankful that we have this opportunity, opportunity to give back to you of what we owe. We pray that you be with us always and be forgiving of our many sins. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
15, verses 1 through 17. I am the Bible, and ye are the branches. A song that we don't sing a lot, I think a song that we don't sing in the night. Uh, and I say that because somewhere in the middle of this song, I may get lost and forget the tune. <laughs> I expect you to cover me up. Uh, as I mentioned, it will be the song before the lesson. If you're able and you would like to stand with us, please do. <coughs> And for those in the car, I would highly recommend you stand outside your yeah. car. <laughs> Good to see you. We're glad you're not working this week, and it's nice to see you with your whole family. We know how much you love the Lord and how much you really want to be here, but sometimes work requires us not to be here, and so it's good to see you. Good to see you with the entire family, and it's good to see uh, Bill and Hilda. They have, they've been away for a little bit because of sickness, and so we're glad to see them and pray the Lord continues to bless all of you, and it's good to see the visitors that we have, even those I might not know or be aware of. We're glad that you're here and pray the Lord blesses you for having been here. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. 
Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have, lo I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This, is my, this I command you, that you love one another." And so as we've been looking at John, we noticed and pointed out that God created the world with the Word. And that the Word has gone back up to heaven and sent, is going to go back up to heaven and send the Helper. But the question is, what does He expect of us while we're here? And what does He expect of us while the Helper's here? By the way, if you're visiting with us for the first time, you notice that your sermon outline has some blank lines under, uh, in it. Those blank lines are underlined on the overhead so you can write those words in there because some people find it easier to pay attention and stay on track by writing those in. And they'll be underlined on the overhead for you to write in there in those spaces. First thing I want you to understand is this. Jesus is talking to them. He's talking to them about vineyards. Now, you and I and my wife, by the way, lived in, in Napa. Uh, and we moved here from Napa. She's never quite forgiven me for that. But nonetheless, we've, we've moved here from, from Napa. And there were beautiful... Uh, vineyards there all the time, and you would see hundreds of uh, of, of vineyard, uh, uh, sorry, hundreds of vines, uh, and, and the vineyards that were there. Now, what you have to understand is, is when he, he's talking about this illustration, he's not talking about a bunch of vineyards. He's not talking about a bunch of vines. He's talking about one. He's talking about one vine. Now, the vine, if you're not familiar with with um, um, grapes and stuff, the vine is what is in the ground and comes up. And the branches every year are strung from that vine. We think that the branches are the vines, but they're actually the branches that come off the vine. And every year they prune those and they cut them back. But the, vi the vine is always the same and it's one. And Jesus, uh, God's, or Jesus is going to be using the illustration of the vine and that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about a vineyard that has a bunch of vines and a bunch of branches. Because if you think that, you're going to get a different understanding of what he's talking about. And so as he begins, the first thing that he says is, in verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. What we need to understand is God is the vine dresser or the owner of the vine. He's the one that owns the vine. In Isaiah 27, in verse 2, talking about Israel, he says, In that day a vineyard of wine sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water, uh, I water it every moment so that no one will damage it. I guard it night and day. The vineyard belongs to God. It's not ours. It's His. And it is the vine that we're, that we're talking about as we address this. And Jesus, uh, God says, or Jesus says that God has one true vine. Now I want us to remember that. He has one true vine. He's not talking about churches. He's talking about the vine. He's talking about from where everything comes for the feeding of the branches. Because that's what the vine does. The vine provides food. The vine provides water, nutrients, and everything comes to the branches by and through the vine. And so in verse 6 it says, Jesus said to him, I am, or in verse 6 Jesus points out that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. There is no other way for God to produce fruit except through the vine, and that vine is Jesus. It's Jesus. 
And if, if the church is God's body, then the church is the one church that belongs to Him. But Jesus is the vine. He's the one from where all these blessings come from. Jesus is the true vine because Ephesians 2 and verse 18 it says, For through Him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. There is no way to get to God except through Jesus. There is no way to bear fruit to God except through Jesus. He is the vine. That's who, uh, that's who Jesus is. He's the vine. And so in verse 2 He tells us the purpose for the vine. He says, Every branch in me that that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And in this illustration, he's going to talk about branches. And just so that you're clear, branches do not stand for denominations. Branches do not stand for local churches. Branches are the people. Each one of you is a branch. Each one of you is deriving your nourishment and your source from Jesus. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about denominations. He's not talking about individual local congregations. He's talking about each individual person. Because the only way we're part of God's people is if we're attached to Jesus. And so he says every branch that, bears, uh, uh, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it may uh, bear more fruit. Now Israel used to be God's vineyard. In Isaiah 5, in verse 1 and 2, it says, Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a, on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless grapes. And so Israel had been God's vineyard. It had been the place from where God was looking for fruit to come. But as you, as you know and as you and I understand, it was pulled up. Now I want you to understand why it was pulled up. Because if you don't understand why it was pulled up, then we're not going to understand what it means to be the branch or what it means to bear fruit. In Isaiah 5 and verse 3, continuing, he says... And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have done with it? In other words, God says, I did everything for Israel. I did everything that, that a vineyard needed. Verse 4 says, Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its walls and it will become, uh, a, uh, become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. Uh, uh, it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain, no rain on it. God says, because I came to look for fruit on this vine and I didn't find any, I am no longer going to waste my resources taking care of this vine. Why in the world would, would I? Would you? Would you do that? Now, what was it he was looking for? Verse 7 says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice. But behold, bloodshed. For righteousness. But behold, a cry of distress. What was it God was looking for? He was looking for two things. He was looking for for people who believe in justice and for people who believe in righteousness. That's what he was looking for. He was looking for people that were going to do right and were going to treat people right and were going to love God right. That's what he was looking for. He wasn't looking for rich people. He wasn't looking for businessmen. He wasn't looking for entrepreneurs. He wasn't looking for anybody you can think of except people who are righteous and people who do what is right and just. That's what he was looking for. And so because he didn't find that, he destroyed Israel a couple of times. They went off into Assyrian captivity in, in uh, uh, 707. And then in, in, uh, um, later on, they, uh, Israel, the two northern tribes went off into Babylonian captivity. And in Jesus' day, he came to the temple. And when he came to the temple, he was looking for a house of prayer. He was looking for people that would spend time in righteous activity 
praying, and what did he find? Money changers. Not that there's anything wrong with being a money changer. But he found money changers in the temple making noise and being more concerned about their profit than they were about giving people a place to come and worship God and get into a relationship with Him. And so as Jesus is talking to His disciples about that beautiful temple where that was going on, He says to them in Matthew 24, during His life, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when His disciples came up to the point out the temple building to him and he said to them do you not see all these things truly I say to you not not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down Jesus says they used to be my vine they used to be my my vineyard but now I'm going to tear them up and take them away because they're not producing the kind of fruit they're supposed to produce well what did they produce they produced people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees The Pharisees were so strict they thought nobody else was as good as they were. Because they thought they were keeping God's commandments perfectly and properly and and nobody else was worthy then of getting to heaven. And so they treated other people with contempt. And the Sadducees were on the other end. They didn't believe in miracles or angels or the Spirit. And that's what was produced Jesus was looking for righteousness. He was looking for justice. He was looking for people who understood that their righteousness was based on their relationship with God. And he was looking for people who were going to treat other people properly and not cheat them or steal from them. And so he took away Israel as his vine. Because a vine is supposed to produce fruit. Remember the parable? of the landowner who had a vineyard and he rented it out and he sent his servants down to get what was due him it says in Matthew 21 and verse 34 when the harvest time approached he sent his sir, his slaves to the vine grows to receive his produce God expects something we often like to talk about how much God is sharing with us and giving to us and he is and he does But God expects something. God isn't doing this just to do it and say, well, I'll just do this and it doesn't matter what they do or how they act. You know, that's kind of our culture today when it comes to business. Some people think the purpose for business is to give you a job. There's There's a purpose for business. They're supposed to make a profit. They're not around to just give you a job. Vineyards aren't around just to give you something. They're to make God a prophet. They're supposed to bring fruit for God. And when they don't, He tears it up and takes it away. Verse 3, He says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, there's two ways you can take this because this comes right after Jesus said to the, to the twelve, One of you is a traitor and is going to betray me. And Judas had gone off to do that. And so maybe when Jesus says this, he's referring to the fact that through his word, through Jesus' words, he had cleaned them out and made them clean for the task for which he was going to do. Or maybe he's also talking about the fact that through the word, you and I are cleansed for the purpose of serving God. And that's the way we're cleansed today. In John 13 and verse 10, he says, Jesus said to him, uh, he who has bathed needs only to, to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. That's what he's referring to. He was referring to the fact that at the time he said this, that Judas was with them. But by the end of the dinner, Judas goes off to do what he's going to do. And Jesus is talking to his disciples and says, My word is what cleans you. But we also need to understand that his word is what sanctifies us. And his word is truth. And what we're being cleansed of is error. What we're being cleansed of is wrong thinking and wrong attitudes. That's what God is trying trying to cleanse us from and get us back to the way we were in the Garden of Eden before Satan came along and lied to us. And as long as people are lying, we have to be cleansed every day. And that's why it's difficult for us when we listen to the radio or we listen to television and we listen to the news and we go, do I believe them? Or do I not believe them? Because what you believe is going to determine how you act. And so Christians are washed and cleansed by the Word of God. In Ephesians 5 and verse 26, he says, So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. You see, the Word of God is designed to clean us. 
prune us and take care of us. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, he says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. You see, obedience to the truth sanctifies us so that we can serve. Jesus tells his disciples that you're clean, but not all of you. And so in verse 4, he begins to tell them about the process of producing fruit. He says, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And this doesn't seem like a new idea. I mean, everybody knows that if you take a branch of a vine and you cut it off and you just leave it by itself, it's going to die. Everybody knows that. But what Jesus is telling them is that's not just true in the physical world. That's true in the spiritual world as well. Branches have to stay connected to produce the fruit that the vine is going to want. That's why in Galatians 2 and verse 20 he says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He points out that he lives not because of himself, but he lives because he's believing in Christ who gives him life. Now I want us to understand that. We don't live because of what we have done. We live because we stay connected to Jesus. That's how we live. We don't live because we stay connected to some church. We live because we stay connected to Jesus. And Jesus makes us His church. And there's a difference between those two things. And sometimes I think we get them mixed up. In Philippians 1 and verse 11 it says, And having been, uh, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He points out, that you and I get this fruit of righteousness. You remember what God was looking for in, in uh, His vine with Israel? Righteousness, wasn't He? You know why He never found righteousness? Because they detached themselves from God. And, G and Paul says that if you want to be righteous, you have to connect yourself to God. You have to connect yourself to Jesus. He's the vine. He's the one that you and I follow. He's the one we believe. And when we do that, it's going to glorify God and bring Him fruit. You see, disciples who stay connected to Jesus will bear fruit. That's what verse 5 says. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember I told you that the branches are not local churches. Here Jesus says that. Jesus says, you are the branches. He's talking to his apostles. There was 11 of them at that particular time because Judas was gone. But there was 11 of them. He said, you're a branch, 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 and you're a branch. And so each and every one of us are branches. Each and every one of us are to be tied into Jesus. Each and every one of us gets our support and our strength from being tied in to Jesus. And if we're not tied into Jesus, you can sit in a Church of Christ assembly and it's not going to do you any single good at all whatsoever because to produce fruit, we have to produce Jesus' fruit. And what is Jesus' fruit? Well, it's righteous activity. And Galatians talks about it like this. In Galatians chapter 5, and down here at verse 22 where he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit... He simply points out, but the fruit of the Spirit, and notice that it's one fruit, not a bunch of fruit, it's one fruit. There's one grape. Uh, you know, I'm not into wine. Some people are into wine, and they can take the wine, they can look at it, and go, oh yeah, it's got good color to it, and they smell it before they drink it. It's got a good bouquet, they say, and then they look at it, and then they slosh it around in their, uh, in their tongue, and they spit it out, and they go, oh, it has a good flavor. It's got a bunch of different qualities, but you know where it all comes from? One grape. It comes from the grape. That, that's how wine is. Uh, and Jesus is telling us there is a fruit that comes from the Spirit. And it has a lot of different characteristics, but it's the same fruit. It comes from the one fruit. It's one fruit. It's not a bunch of different fruit. It's not like you can pick the ones you want and cast away the ones you don't want. He says in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Some of us like to pick and choose those. 
I like to be joyous, but I'm not going to be patient. I like to be happy, but I'm not going to be kind. Well, that's like taking that wine and getting rid of the smell. You see, there is a fruit that comes from being connected to that vine. And that's what he's talking about. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But fruitless branches, he says in verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and, uh, and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, here's what I want you to understand. He's talking about the branches, not the world. This isn't the world's going to be condemned. This is my branches are going to be burned. He says, you can be a branch and you can move yourself away from Jesus and you're going to be burned up. And the reason you're going to be burned up is because you're not producing fruit. Why in the world would Jesus want to spend his resources on someone who isn't producing fruit? In Matthew 7 and verse 19, um, um, Jesus says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's what you would do if you had an orchard or a vineyard. That's what you do in your garden. If you plant a garden and you find out there's one scrawny little plant in there that's, not, that's drinking up all the, all, all the water and all the minerals that you're putting down there, you yank that thing out and throw it away. Jesus says that's what happens to my branches if they don't abide in me. In Luke 13 and verse 6, Jesus says, And he began telling them this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit. Because that's what a fig tree is supposed to produce. He came looking for fruit and did not find any. And he said to the vine keepers, Behold, for three years I've, I've come looking for fruit uh, on this fig tree without finding any. By the way, it's really talking about Israel and the fact that Jesus spent three years trying to cultivate Israel to get some fruit. It goes on in verse 7 and says, Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig uh, uh, around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. God says, I will spend time on branches that might be struggling to produce. And I might give them a little bit extra time. But don't misunderstand it. There comes a time when Jesus says that's enough. And He cuts them off. And they're going to be dried up. And they're going to be burned. And He's talking about His people. He's not talking about the wicked, terrible people out in the world. They never have been attached to Jesus. They never have been part of the vine. And so why in the world do we get so excited about mass murders that are done in the world by people who've never known Jesus? That's kind of the way we expect them to act. Well, we hate thinking about the, the fact they act like that. But it's not surprising they do because they're not attached to Jesus. They don't have the, the, the joy and the love and the compassion and the care and the concern for Jesus. And that's why the message that we preach, all of us, not me, all of us, the message we preach is a message that's going to save the world. Amen. It's not politics. It's not whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It's are you teaching people to be connected to Jesus? Fruitful branches, on the other hand, they get everything they need. Verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my word, words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done for you. Amen. Jesus says, If I have a tree that's producing fruit, I take care of that tree. Don't you? If you plant a garden and plant, you have tomatoes and tomatoes are getting big, do you say, I'm not going to give it any more water? <laughs> no! Matter of fact, you make sure it has enough water and you even put a net over it so the birds and the squirrels don't come and take it away. You take care of it and if they're really good tomatoes or they're really good pumpkins, you'll sit out there with a gun so nobody steals it because you're going to win first prize at the fair. God says, that's what I do with my people. 
That's what I do. I spend my resources on them. And why? Because they have my word in them. Amen. Now there's two ways you can take that. They have the verbal explanation or they have God in them because Jesus is the Word. That's why Psalm 37 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now here's what you have to understand. When it says delight yourself in the Lord, it's not Lord, 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 oh, I, I'm, you're so wonderful, you're so terrific, because I want a Cadillac. <laughs> You know, maybe I'm um, dating myself, but that used to be the car to get. Maybe I should say, you're going to get a Tesla today. <laughs> what God is saying is this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He's going to give you everything, because what you want is what the Lord wants. That's what you want. If your delight is in the Lord... Guess what you want? Whatever the Lord wants. If your delight is in baseball, oh man, you're excited when you get a new player. If you're excited about soccer, then you're excited if you get this new guy who can run like the wind. Well, God says, if you're delighted in me, I'll give you what you want. He's not a vending machine. We're to delight in Him. In 1 John 3 and verse 22, that's why he says, whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Why? Because He knows that what we want is what, what, he, what he wants. He says, for whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. In verse 14 of 1 John 5, it says, this is the confidence which we have before Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. When that tomato plant is starting... To wilt a little bit on the leaves, what do you do? Water. You water it. Why? Because it's a good tree. It's a good plant. I'm going to get good fruit from it. I'll be able to cook it up and share it with my friends and they'll think I'm a wonderful cook. <laughs> Actually, my wife is the wonderful cook. I'm the wonderful eater. <laughs> so there's a purpose for the vine dresser owning a vine. And the purpose for the vine dresser owning the vine, verse 8 says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. You know what God wants from His vineyard? He wants people to say, That's God's child. And God's going to go, Yep. <laughs> they are. That's the way my kid acts. When my wife and I had our children at home and they would go out, I would always make sure if I was home to greet them at the door before they would leave. And as they would leave, I would tell them, you remember whose son you are. And if they were my, if they, if they weren't Christians yet, they meant, you better be careful what you do because it's going to reflect on your dad. But when they became Christians, I would say to them, you remember whose son you are. As they walk out that door. And it wasn't me. It was God. You know what God gets out of us? Glory. You know what He went looking for in Israel? Glory. And you know what He found? A bunch of rebellious, murderous people who didn't care about right, who took their weights and drilled holes in them so that they wouldn't actually be a pound and they would steal money from individuals. They found individuals who went into widows' houses and for long prayers and pretense received money from them so they could get money and have property and they didn't care about the orphans because it required them to take care of them and spend their money. That's what God found. And what do we do? We sit around arguing about how to take care of orphans and they never take care of them. sit around arguing about how to take care of the poor and we never take care of them. We care about our religious civil government, but we'll cheat somebody when we sell them a car and don't tell them that it has a transmission that's about to go out. Or Brother Herman, we had breakfast yesterday, and the men's breakfast, and Brother Herman was telling us that he bought himself a nice Tesla. That's wonderful. He said he likes driving past gas stations. <laughs> Who doesn't today? <laughs> but he was also telling us that, that a few days later, a notice came out on his Tesla that said, need a battery replacement. 
cost a pretty penny. See, somebody saw him coming and didn't treat him like you ought to treat him. He was more concerned about making money than he was about being just. That's what God found in Israel. And guess what he did? Destroyed them. God's looking for fruit. God expects glory. In Ephesians chapter 1, after he tells us that we have all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, three times God says, to the praise of the glory of his grace in verse 6. In verse 12 he says, uh, 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 who first hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And then in verse 14 he says, to the praise of his glory. Guess what God wants? And guess how God gets it? When people see your good works and they, what's the rest of the verse? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Why in the world, Mike, have you stayed with your wife for, how long have been married? 47 years. <laughs> how, why have you stayed with her that long? Because I love her. Because God told me to love her. God showed me how to love her. Has it been easy? For her, no. It's been pretty easy for me. But not for her. But why do we do it? To bring God glory. God gets glory. Our problem is sometimes we focus too much on what we get. Forgiveness of sins, redemption, blessings. And you do. But God says, I'm giving you all that. So you can go out and glorify my name. So you can go tell people how wonderful it is to be part of God's community and part of God's people and that we love each other. And that when you need something, I'm here to help you. In Ephesians 3 and verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power which works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't care if you do the Lord's Supper right if your heart's not right with Him. God doesn't care if you sing a cappella if your heart's not right with Him. We think those are the things that make us right because we're not like other groups. And we become like the Pharisees. We look down on them. But God loves His vineyard. In verse 9 He says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. What's the nutrient that makes good Christians? It's the love of God. And how is that love manifested? John 10 and verse 12, 17 says, For this reason the Father loves me. Well, why, why does God love Jesus? Because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. Jesus says, You know why God loves me? Because I do what God would do. I give up my life for them. I give up my life for my wife. I give up my life for my employees. I give up my life for my neighbors. I give up my life for the Democrats. And I give up my life for the Republicans. We're so divided today. It's amazing that we give up our life for anything. In verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. And that doesn't mean that you go down a checklist and I've done this one and this one and this one and this one so I'll... I mean, the love of God. No, you misunderstand it. What he's saying is that if you love me, you will naturally keep my commandments. If you're a baseball fan, you'll naturally understand what's going on in the game. You ever sat down with somebody who doesn't know anything about baseball? Our son-in-law didn't know much about baseball. He didn't watch it, watch it much in Costa Rica. But he got married and he sat down and began to watch baseball with us. And he said, what does that mean? What does that mean? What do those lines mean? What does that mean? He didn't know anything about it. Why? He didn't have a love for baseball. He wasn't taught about it. Hadn't been converted to being the best Dodger fan in the world. <laughs> and what is this that we have from God? It's His Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 13, he says, For by one Spirit were we all baptized in one body, whether Jews or Greeks, and whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink in one Spirit. People, people want to say, I want to be able to speak in tongues. I want to do miracles. Oh, just have, let me have the Spirit. But they'll hate their wife and divorce them. You see, what we want is a dramatic... That's what we want. 
We want people to look at us and go, oh, wow, what a Christian. God says, isn't that why I gave you my laws and my rules? You see, we need to drink of the one spirit of God. Because Jesus, believe it or not, wants you to be happy. Don't believe what the devil says. The devil told Adam and Eve that they wouldn't be happy unless they could eat of that fruit. God says, no, I want you happy. I made you to be happy. I expect you to be happy. In verse 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. The problem isn't that we want to be joyful. We all want to be happy. The problem is do we want to be happy with what Jesus is happy about? Or do I want to be happy because the stock market went up? Or am I happy when I get that new car? Or when I get that new promotion at work? And that's what makes me happy. Or are you happy when you have a relationship with God and it doesn't matter whether the stock market goes up or down, whether it crashes or whether you have a new car or a drop clunker? Jesus wants joyful branches. In John 17, 13, he says, But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that you may have my joy made full in themselves. You know, it's interesting that he says, I want you to be happy in the world. We just heard about a mass murder. Why in the world should I be happy? Why should I be joyous? Because my life is not contingent on what those people do. My life is contingent on what Jesus has done for me. And it doesn't matter the circumstances I live in. It doesn't matter the neighborhood where I live. That's not what's going to make me happy. It might make me physically happy and I might not feel afraid, but it's not going to give me the joy that I need. Because believe it or not, more people die from sicknesses than they do from gunshots. First John 1 and verse 4, John, after talking to them about the Word and that the Word became life and lived among us, it says, in these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Our joy is complete in Christ because we have His joy and His desires and that's what branches are supposed to do. Because the branches come off the vine and if the vine is going to produce wine, then the branches should produce grapes. In John 15 and verse 12, Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus says, God's commandment for me was to love Him. My commandment for you is to love me as I love God. What do you think our commandment should be to each other? Brother Troy walks up and he goes, I love you! And you say, I love you. But don't just do it in words. Do it in deeds. It's a driving motivation for God's people. In 1 John 3 and verse 23, he says, This is his commandment that we believe in the name of the Son of Christ, uh, Son, in his Son Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. I'm going to love you. Not to judge you. Not to criticize you. Not to condemn you. I'm going to love you. 1 John 4 and verse 21, he says, In this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. What's the greatest commandment? What's the second one? And then what's the next verse he says? On these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. You know why God gave you commandments? So you could learn how to love your neighbor. You know why God said don't commit adultery? Because you do. You know why God said don't steal? Because you want to. You know why God says don't covet? Because you do. He says and that's not love. He didn't give you those laws so you can have a checklist and go through them and go, I've done those. He gave you a list so you could see, oh, I know, I, I, I'm, I'm lacking that one. Because the greatest expression of love in verse 13, he says, and greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friend. How is this love expressed? Not just in words. In John 10 and verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. How do you know he's the good shepherd? How do you know he loves you? He's willing to die for you. How do we know, Jesus, that when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, it wouldn't be good for them? 
because of what happened afterwards and what did God do? He came down here and said, you guys listen to Satan. I do love you. And they said, how much do you love us? Jesus? And he spread his arms and said, this is how much I love you. And he was nailed to the cross. And we go, I don't like that person because they're a Democrat. I don't like that person because they're a Republican. I hate independence. And we don't even think that we need to correct those things. Because that's what we see on television. That's what we hear on the radio. Romans 5 and verse 6, Jesus says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, I love Jim because he's a brother, but not a sinner. Then we still haven't learned the love of God. And we might produce good church-going people who keep the rules, but we haven't produced the Spirit of God inside of people. And that's what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for. He says, you go about over land and sea to make a proselyte, and when you make him, he's twice the son of hell as yourselves. So Jesus says, why am I doing this? Because I want you to be my friends. In verse 14, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Because that's what friends do. Those slaves, he treats us as friends. In James chapter 2 and verse 23, talking about Abraham, he says, and the scripture was fulfilled which said, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You know, if I'm walking down the street and I hear somebody say, you know that Don Waltz is a terrible person. I'm going to go, who are you talking about? My friend isn't. Who are you talking about? Why am I going to do that? Because he's my friend. Why am I going to do what he says? Because he's my friend. You see, friends aren't slaves. In verse 15, he says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You know the difference between a friend and a slave? A slave, you don't have to tell him why you're doing anything. Just go do it. I told you to go do it, and that's all that, it, that matters. You just go do it. You're a slave. You have no right to know anything of why I'm doing it. But that's not God. God says, I'm treating you guys like friends. In Colossians 1 and verse 26, he tells us the mystery of the world. He says the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been made manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery among the Gentiles. And what is that mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. The mystery is getting God inside of people. Amen. So in verse 16, he says, I picked you guys, you didn't pick me. He says, you, uh, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give it to you. They're supposed to go bear fruit. Just that's why I pick them. Paul says in Romans 1 and 13, I, uh, uh, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that, I, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Here's what I want to ask you. Is there any fruit produced when you hang around with your friends? And if you hang around with friends for a long time and there's never any fruit produced, maybe we're not attached to the vine like we ought to be. Colossians 1 and verse 16 says, 
which has come to you just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Have you lived in a neighborhood for 30 years and haven't been able to produce fruit? Have you lived with your family for 30 years? You've never been able to teach your children? Not always our fault, but it's a good question, isn't it? And he says, and the wonderful thing about the fruit you do produce is it's never going to end. In John 6 and verse 68, he says, Simon and Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. They're in this book. And they should be in your heart. And you should be sharing that with individuals. You should be reading to your children or talking to your children at night when you put them to bed and telling them stories about the great King David who defeated Goliath with a little stone on on his forehead. Or the three friends who were thrown uh, into a furnace and didn't get burned up. Instead, Instead we'll read them all the secular books and stories from Mother Goose and they know them all. But they have no idea about the great men and the great stories that are in God's Word. And then we wonder why we lose them. We have the words of eternal life. And so Jesus says to them, This I command you, that you love one another. Because we were sanctified in Christ Jesus. For that very purpose. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren. He didn't sanctify you to make you religiously right. He didn't sanctify you so you could do cultic practices religiously right. He sanctified you so that we would learn how to love. He says, fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again. This world wants you divided and wants you to hate people for the color of their skin or their political practice or how much money they have or what country they come from. This world wants you to do everything, wants to do everything it can to get you to hate them and treat them differently. And Jesus says, if you're born into my kingdom, You learn to love people that are unlovable. You learn to love your enemies. You learn to love people that hurt you. You learn to love people that have abused you. You learn to love. For you've been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. God's word return to prepare a place for believers and receive the kingdom that we're going to get to be part of. And while Jesus is away, he expects fruit from his vineyard. And those who are baptized, who believe Jesus is ruling or baptized to bring glory to the Father in the name of Jesus. If you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus, then you can't bring glory to God yet. Because you haven't even been attached to the vine. But you can. And it's simple. It's not that hard. Trust God. Trust Jesus. Believe in the story. If you want to, if you want to know anything, ask Randy. He can tell you. Mm-hmm. We can aid or help you. Let us know while together we stand. Well, let's Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him?
Creator, our Redeemer, our Rock, and our Hope. We come before you at this time, giving you thanks for all that you have done for us in this life and through your Son, who you installed as your King to rule over this earth and to rule over us in our lives. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to always acknowledge him as our King and our Savior. We just give you glory and honor for the wisdom that you showed in your plan of redemption, for the grace that you provide for us each day of our life. And Father, we humbly ask that you would strengthen us as we live our lives, that you would help us to nourish our lives through your word so that we might truly bear fruit for you. We realize, Father, that the fruit that we bear is to be like you. So please help us to be more patient, to be more kind, to be more loving, to be more selfless, to be more humble, to be more giving of ourselves to others around us so that they can truly see you and your Son living in us. Father, we just are so appreciative and amazed at how 
much that you do for us and how much strength you do give us. And again, Father, we pray for those that are grieving. Father, we don't ask that you remove their grief, but rather that you strengthen them and comfort them in that grief that they are showing for their loved ones that they have lost. We pray, Father, that you would be with the congregation here and each one individually, that as they serve you, that it reflects upon you and that your name will always be glorified by the things that they do, each of us, in our daily lives. Be with us as now as we leave this place. Please provide us safe journeys to our home. We also pray that you would continue to bless us each day of our life. We give thanks again for your Son who gave his life for us. For it is in his name. Amen. Amen. Can you stay? Forever? Oh. Well, I said a few minutes. <laughs> we miss you, Ben. It's good to see you again. Uh, let me remind you of a couple of things. Memori uh, Mariel's memorial is this Saturday at 1 o'clock at the building. Donna Chrismore lost her daughter. We'll uh, be figuring out uh, memorial services for that. Albert and Afia are out of town in Vacaville. He's preaching there and uh, traveling. Or Richard and Susan, they'll be out for the next three or four days. And I don't know of anybody else that's traveling. I know some of you are going to be returning home after the memorial. We pray that God blesses you on your trip and keeps you there. The uh, rest everybody knows. And we hope that uh, your nose is in the book. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.